Greetings data enthusiast and welcome back to our channel. Today we are embarking on a thrilling exploration into the captivating realm of big data with big data into questions and answers. And before we begin, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in big data by graduating from the big universities and the best universities or a professional who elicits to switch career with big data by learning from the experts and try giving a shot to simply learn postgraduate program in data engineering in collaboration with Purdue University and IBM. The course link is mentioned in the description box below that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. And if these are the types of videos you would like to watch, then hit the subscribe button, like and press on the bell icon to never miss on future content. So stay tuned with us until the end of this video and don't forget to register your opinion in the comment section below. And now starting with the interview questions. So our first question is define big data and explain the ways of big data. So big data can be described as a compilation of intricate, unstructured or semi-structured data sets that possesses the potential to yield actionable insights and the four fundamental dimensions often referred as the V's of big data are as follows. The first is volume. This aspect pertains to the sheer magnitude of data generated and collected. It signifies the immense quantity of data that conventional data processing techniques might struggle to handle. The next is variety. This factor emphasizes the diverse range of formats and types in which data is presented. Big data encompasses structured, unstructured and semi-structured data from various sources. And the next is velocity. Referring to the speed at which data is generated and must be processed, the velocity dimension underscores the need for real-time or near real-time data analysis due to the rapid influx of data. Veracity. Veracity highlights the reliability and trustworthiness of the available data. Inaccurate, inconsistent or uncertain data can adversely impact the quality of insights derived from big data analysis. So this was about big data and the V's of big data. Now moving on to the next question that is what do you mean by commodity hardware? So the term commodity hardware alludes to the minimal hardware essentials necessary for operating the Apache Hadoop framework. Any hardware configuration that satisfies the minimum prerequisites of Hadoop is categorized as commodity hardware. So this was all about commodity hardware. Now moving on to the next question that is define and describe the term FSCK. So FSCK, an acronym for file system check denotes a command employed to initiate a summary assessment of Hadoop's HDFS condition. It solely identifies errors and does not undertake corrective actions. FSCK can be executed on the complete system or subset of files. And this was all about FSCK. Now moving on to the next question that is what is the purpose of the JPS command in Hadoop? The JPS Java process status command is utilized to ascertain the functionality of various Hadoop daemons. It primarily validates the operational status of daemons such as name mode, data node, resource manager and node manager. And now moving on to the next question that is how is Hadoop related to big data? So when delving into the realm of big data, Hadoop emerges as a pivotal framework. Hadoop, an open source platform, is tailored for the storage, processing and analysis of intricate, unstructured data sets to glean valuable insights and intelligence. This is how Hadoop is related to big data. And moving on to the next question, that is sixth question. Define HDFS and YARN and talk about their respective components. So Hadoop Distributive File System HDFS is the core storage mechanism within the Hadoop ecosystem. It is responsible for housing diverse data types in a distributed environment. HDFS comprises two integral components. The first is name node and this central node preserves metadata concerning all data blocks within HDFS. And the second is data node. These nodes serve as slaves tasked with storing the actual data blocks. And now talking about YARN, that is yet another resource negotiator. YARN serves as the resource manager for managing resources and establishing an execution environment for processes. And YARN also features two key components. The first is resource manager. It allocates resources to corresponding node managers according to requirements. And the second is node manager. This component oversees task execution on each data node. And now moving on to the next question that is explain the different features of Hadoop. So Hadoop possesses several distincting features that make it a prominent choice for handling big data challenges. 
one of its most significant features is being open source, which means its code can be freely modified and adapted to fulfill varying user and analytical needs. Another vital feature is incorporate new hardware resources into its cluster by adding new nodes. Furthermore, Hadoop employs data replication to ensure data recovery in the event of failures, enhancing data reliability. Additionally, the concept of data locality in Hadoop is crucial as it prioritizes moving computation processes to the data itself, resulting in improved processing efficiency. And now we'll move to the next question that is define the port numbers for name node, task tracker and job tracker. So the port numbers for the essential components in a Hadoop cluster are as follows. So the port number for name node is 50070 and for the task tracker it's 50060 and for the job tracker it's 50030. And moving on to the next question that is what do you mean by indexing in HDFS? In HDFS that is Hadoop distributed file system. Indexing refers to the organization of data blocks based on their sizes. Each data block contains a pointer to the location of the subsequent block, which contributes to the sequential data storage. The data nodes within the Hadoop cluster manage these data blocks while the name node keeps track of their arrangement and distribution. And now we will move to the next question that is what are edge nodes in Hadoop. So edge nodes play a pivotal role in Hadoop environments acting as intermediaries connecting the Hadoop cluster with external networks. These nodes serve as platforms for running client applications and cluster management tools. They also serve as staging areas for data processing tasks. Typically, a single edge node can support multiple Hadoop clusters. Due to their multifaceted role, edge nodes require enterprise level storage capabilities. And the next question is, what are some of the data management tools used with edge nodes in Hadoop? So when it comes to edge nodes in Hadoop, several data management tools and frameworks come into play. Notable among them are Uzi, Ambari, Pig, Flume. So these tools are commonly utilized in conjunction with edge nodes to enhance data management capabilities within Hadoop clusters. So these were the data management tools that we use with edge nodes in Hadoop. Now moving on to the next question that is explain the core methods of a reducer. So reducer are fundamental components in Hadoop's MapReduce programming paradigm. They perform data aggregation and consolidation tasks. Reducers encompass three core methods. The first is setup and the third is cleanup. After the reduction process is complete, the cleanup method is invoked. It is responsible for clearing temporary files and performing any necessary cleanup operations at the end of a reducer task. Certainly, here is the information provided in your request. And now we'll move to the next question. That is, talk about the different tombstone markers used for deletion purposes in HBase. In the realm of HBase, a prominent player in the big data landscape, tombstone markers play a crucial role in facilitating data deletion. There are three distinct types of tombstone markers, each serving a specific purpose. The first is family delete marker. This marker is employed to signify the removal of an entire column family along with its associated columns. By utilizing the family delete marker, all the columns within the concerned family are effectively marked for deletion. And the next is version delete marker. When a particular version of a single column needs to be expunged, the version delete marker comes into play. This marker allows for the selective removal of a specific version of a single column, ensuring precise data management. And next we have is column delete marker. In scenarios where all versions of a single column are to be wiped out, the column delete marker comes to the forefront. By employing this marker, all versions of the designated column are appropriately marked for deletion. So these were the tombstone markers that are used for deletion purposes and base. And now moving on to the 14th question that is deploying a big data solution. So how do you deploy a big data solution? So embarking on the journey to deploy a comprehensive big data solution involves a strategic three step process. The first step is data ingestion. Commencing the deployment, the initial step involves the acquisition of data from diverse sources, encompassing social media platforms, log files and relevant business documents. This data is collected either through real-time streaming mechanisms or batch processing. The next step is data storage. Once the data is procured, the subsequent task is storing it within a suitable database. The choice often rests between the Hadoop distributed file system, HDFS and HBase. 
HDFS excels in sequential access scenarios, while HBase is optimized for random read and write operations. And the next step we have is data processing. The final phase of the deployment centers around data processing. Frameworks such as Hadoop, Spark, MapReduce, Flink, and Pig step in to perform the intricate task of processing the amazed data. These frameworks are instrumental in deriving valuable insights from the raw data. So this is how you deploy a big data solution. Moving on to the next question that is distinguishing NFS and HDFS. That is how is NFS different from HDFS. So the first point is for NFS it can both store and process small volumes of data. Whereas in HDFS it is explicitly designed to store and process big data. And in NFS the data is stored in dedicated hardware. Whereas in HDFS data is divided into data blocks that are distributed on the local drives of the hardware. And in NFS in the case of system failure you cannot access the data. And in HDFS data can be accessed even in the case of a system failure. And in NFS NFS runs on a single machine. There's no chance for data redundancy. And in HDFS it runs on a cluster of machines and hence the replication protocol may lead to redundant data. And the next question is list the different file permissions in HDFS for files or directory levels. So in the Hadoop distributed file system that is HDFS distinct permissions are assigned to files and directories catering to different users level owner group and others each user level boasts three distinct permissions for files the R permission enables reading of files content the W permission empowers writing data into a file the X that is execute permission while present does not grant execution rights for HDFS files and if we talk about directories the R permission facilitates listing the contents of a specific directory and the W permission allows the creation or deletion of a directory and the X that is execute permission is associated with assessing child directories within the parent directory. This array of permission fosters a granular and secure approach to managing files and directories within the HDFS ecosystem. And now moving on to the next question that is enumerate the three modes available for running Hadoop. In the realm of big data interviews, a frequently encountered query revolves around the three operational modes of Hadoop. That is, first is standalone mode, second is pseudo distributed mode, and the third is fully distributed mode. So, standalone mode, this serves as Hadoop's default setting, utilizing the local file system for both input and output operations. Primarily geared towards debugging, standalone mode lacks support for HDF, that is, Hadoop distributed file system and lacks the custom configuration associated with and lacks the custom configuration associated with mapred site.xml core site.xml and sdfs hyphen site.xml files and now talking about pseudo distributed mode this is referred to as the single node cluster pseudo distributed mode involves housing both the name mode and data node on the same machine this configuration concentrates the whole Hadoop demons onto a single node effectively merging the roles of master and slave nodes and then we have is fully distributed node operating as a multi node cluster this node that is operating as a multi node cluster this mode leverages multiple nodes simultaneously to execute Hadoop tasks in the setup distinct nodes accommodate various Hadoop demons maintaining a clear demarcation between master and slave nodes so this was about the three modes available for running Hadoop now moving on to the next question that is the define the concept of overfitting. So overfitting characterizes a modeling error that arises when a function is excessively tailored to a limited set of data points. This results in an intricate model that struggles to account for unique nuances or peculiarities within the data sets. The repercussions of overfitting are detrimental to the model's ability to generalize rendering the predictive capabilities of overfitted models dubious. These models falter when applied to external or novel datasets. Within the realm of machine learning, overfitting ranks among the most prevalent challenges. A model falls into the overfitting category when it excels on the training dataset but performs dismally on the test dataset. Numerous strategies exist to avoid overfitting, including cross validation, pruning, early stopping, regularization, and ensemble techniques. So, this was all about overfitting. Now moving on to the next question that is elaborate on the concept of outliers. An outlier pertains to a data point or observation that deviates significantly from the norm within a random sample. Put differently, 
outliers are data values that diverge markedly from the general cluster or group in the data set. These outliers have the potential to influence the behavior of models, often misleading the training process of machine learning algorithms. Adverse effects of outliers encompass prolonged training duration, imprecise models, and subpar outcomes. However, outliers may harbor valuable insights on occasion. This underscores the importance of meticulous investigation and appropriate treatment of outliers. And now, moving on to the next question that is list several methods for detecting outliers. Once again, a pivotal inquiry in big data interviews. Here are six techniques for identifying outliers. First, we'll discuss the first three that is extreme value analysis, probabilistic and statistical models, and linear models. So the first is extreme value analysis. So this method delves into the statistical tales of the data distribution. Utilizing statistical techniques like z-scores on univariate data exemplifies extreme value analysis. The next is probabilistic and statistical models. This approach targets instances deemed improbable within a probabilistic model of the data. A prime instance involves optimizing Gaussian mixture models via the expectation maximization process. Then we have linear models. This methodology involves mapping the data into lower dimensions. Then we have the fourth one that is proximately based models, then information theoretic models and high dimensional outlier detection. This technique discerns data instances isolated from the broader dataset group through methods such as cluster, density or nearest neighbor analysis. Then we have information theoretical models. This strategy identifies outliers as instances that augment the complexity of the dataset ultimately impairing it. Then we have high dimensional outlier detection. This method pinpoints outlier subspaces by employing distance measures in higher dimensions. So this was all for this tutorial and this was all for the big data interview questions. Hope you guys found it informative and helpful. Now let's take a minute to hear from our learners who have experienced massive success in their careers by opting out for the Simply Learn course. Hi, I am Asad Shah from Canada and I recently upskilled myself with the professional certification program in data engineering offered by Simply Learn in collaboration with Purdue University. After working for a long time in SQL domain, moving to big data was a great challenge for me. I needed to upgrade my skills to improve my performance in my current course. Curriculum is well formulated, well industry relevant concepts and project, which help me grasp deeper knowledge about big data. Now I can easily carry out my big data projects as well as successfully lead a team of engineers. I even got a decent salary hike. The world is moving at a much faster pace than we think. Make sure you don't lag behind. So upskill yourself and move to a step forward and step closer to your dream. And if you like this session, then like, share and subscribe. If you have any questions, then you can drop them in the comment section below. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more from Simply Learn. Hi there. If you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.